Uh, once again, man, hopefully you're enjoying being here. We are so thankful. Uh, Palm Beach Baptist Network uh, made this uh, possible today, so we're thankful for Dr. Steve Thomas. And uh, Steve, we're thankful for your leadership, and thank you for being the pastor. Pastor too, First Baptist Del Rey. And then we are thankful for our lunch. Our lunch was provided by the Florida Baptist Convention, and that's Al Fernandez. So, and uh, man, we love some Al Fernandez. Um, and then uh, Send Network uh, gets to be a partner of this. We also want to thank Family Church for hosting us here at Iglesia Familia campus. Um, so uh, we love that. So what we want to do is we want to have a little bit of a panel discussion. And we've got a couple questions. There's a little time for you to ask some questions. So if you need to think, think quick. but Because we, we'll try to get them answered because we want to serve you. But one of the things we want you to make crystal clear is today is not about an event. We did not invite you onto our cul-de-sac to have hamburgers and hot dogs and be stuck here the rest of our life. To get a book, to get a t-shirt, check your box, say I went to the think multiplication or thinking multiplication. What the hope and dream is, is today's a launching pad. And I'll tell you, one of the things that has encouraged my heart the most is watching many of you exchange cell phone numbers. Because you are smart, brilliant, amazing people that can serve and connect with each other. And we're not looking for one church to be all that in a bag of chips. We're looking for the church. And if we could all lock arms and pull together. The other thing I want you to be aware of is that, man, we have tons of resources. We'd love to help you in the days ahead. I think uh, there's a business card. If you didn't get one of the blue bags, it's a gift bag. There's a book in there. If you will take the book for somebody else that you want to have the book, please have at it and take it. But there's a card in there. And if I can do anything to serve you, uh, text me, call me. Do me a favor. If you text me, please put your name in there because I won't know who you are (laughs) and help me out. Uh, Also, we want to make you aware that October the 21st is a Saturday in Hialeah, We will be doing something very similar to this, Send Network Espanol, and the whole thing will be in Spanish. So if you're wanting or desiring to be a part of that, we never want language or culture to be a limiter to what God may want to do. And by the way, look at the room. We are a beautiful representation of heaven. So Send Network Espanol, by the way, you can go there, Send Network Espanol, and .net, and you'll see tons of resources in Spanish, and we can help with other resources. So we're running out of time, so let me get to the main thing. So hey, on our panel today, we have Pastor Chris here with us uh, from Family Church. We have Pastor Winston Williams with us with Iglesia Biblica Vida Real. We have Al Fernandez right here from the Florida Baptist Convention, and then we have Pam Wolf who is wearing some multiple hats. She actually um, provides care for our church planter wives um, and also is um, in corporate America crushing it every day. And she is my wife, so sorry, we'll move on. Um, so. so let me start with our first question, and I am going to stick to the cards. Um, so our first question is for Al Fernandez. Al, as we think about uh, developing leaders, and really what we're going to call this panel discussion is reps to developing leaders. So what's it take to develop leaders? Al, I want to ask you the first question. Um, If you were to talk about um, what it would take to develop leaders, where does a leader or a pastor start in raising up disciples or leaders in the local church? Where should a leader or a pastor start? Well, you first start with people who become saved at your church, got baptized, and they're on their journey. Every believer, every Christian uh, is, a, uh, is called by Christ to serve in some capacity. So the first place, uh, every person that comes to Christ uh, is, is, is uh, we should start developing those individuals. Um, it's super important that we understand that because it's it's not about it's 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 not about uh, uh, how, how how much tenure you have or you know how much experience you have. Uh, those are things that that come with time. Uh, I, I love the uh, what Mark said earlier. Um, 
you know, uh, you have to allow people uh, uh, to fail. Uh, you have to allow people to, as you're being developed, they'll make mistakes. But uh, don't ever be afraid to br use brand new Christians and, and, and service. Obviously, you're not going to put them to preach or teach, but they can do a lot of things. So I think we have to, we have to look at this, that uh, every person that comes to our church needs to be developed. That's so good. And by the way, all these guys are resources for you, too, and would do whatever they could to serve you and help you out. So, Winston, we're going to give you question number two. Are there cultural barriers to be aware of in multiplying leaders? Yeah, definitely. There are cultural barriers. And um, I've had the opportunity to engage in conversations uh, with people from different backgrounds and cultures. And um, some tend to be more organic in their approach to leadership development. And some tend to be more systematic. And uh, what I always try to do is, uh, especially when they're working together, I'm trying to uh, help and encourage the one that has the more, the more organic approach to understand how to work with someone who is more systems driven and vice versa so that they can uh, know how to work well with each other. But at the same time, um, I try to help those who are more you know, organic, relational, and you know, we'll just walk together and see where it goes. To value the importance of systems, it is good that, you know, you're trying to do it that way. And again, you know, that's how Jesus did it. But at the same time, uh, have some type of system or process that you can lead that person or that group through. And the same applies to the system, the, the systematic one. Uh, value the relationship. Don't just look at it as a product that needs to be manufactured, but as a disciple that needs to grow in Christ likeness. So good. Thank you, Winston. All right, Chris, you're up. Chris, how long does it take to raise up a maturing disciple leader? Yeah, so I look at the word raise up, and I think it's important to figure out in your mind what is at the top of your list when talking about raising them up. Like, what are you raising them up to? For you, what is success in your mind that you're trying to bring someone up to? Is it leading the class, leading a Bible study, leading the whole program, making a disciple? Like, what is it for you? And what I would say is we have to look at the model of Jesus and ask ourselves, what was his definition of someone who was raised up? And for me, I, I believe and I see in scripture that it was someone who was willing. Like they were willing to follow him and they were willing to be sent out on mission. Because Jesus didn't wait until the end of the three years of his earthly ministry to send everyone out on a mission trip. Like he did that halfway through because they were willing. They weren't fully ready to do it. They were terrified. And then we see at the end, some are still doubting and they all struggled with different things. But they were still willing to be used by Jesus to live on mission. And I think that's how all of us should look at what it means to raise someone up in discipleship is... Do they understand enough that they're willing now to go do this? And then you also use the word uh, maturing believer, right? So something that I heard that I love is a good shepherd moves at the pace of his or her sheep. So if someone's really getting it and they're understanding it, great, catch up and move at their pace and encourage them with it. If they're kind of struggling a little bit, hang back with them, always encouraging them to take the next step in their faith but move at their pace along with them and guide them in it uh, and allow them the space and time it takes to mature. And as a maturing believer, they should be leading something. They should be doing something, be given opportunities within the ministry or church that you're a part of. Uh, so determining if someone is raised up starts with how you view what it means to be raised up. And I would just challenge and encourage all of us to look at Jesus Look at his model and just find people who are willing and then give them opportunity to serve and then they'll mature through that. Thanks, Chris. That's so good. Okay, Pam, we're going to give you the toughest question of all. Could be a man or a woman out here and they're saying, hey, I don't have time to raise up leaders. So what should they do? 
That's a great question. Uh, time is probably one of our hugest excuses, right? I don't have time. There's not enough time. Um, how much time does it take? And uh, so my, um, part of my philosophy of what God has showed me to do in our life is really make it simple. We're, we're not trying to make uh, discipleship the most difficult thing. Make it simple. It's in your path. You're already in places where you could be leading other women or other men. You're already in a lot of those places. You're already going to some, you might be, uh, you're in a public school and uh, you might be, your, your child might be in athletics. You might be, it might be somebody at the grocery store. It might be somebody that's in your community group that you're meeting with at church. Um, use those opportunities to um, build that relationship and, and call people. You can see, call them out. Man, I've seen how you've interacted um, in the Bible study tonight and consistently are here and consistently um, reaching out to other people to come. Um, I, I want to um, start meeting with you and developing you as a, as a leader. So um, making it simple and not complicating it. What are some ways you've done that? Uh, so um, a couple of women um, in our church plant uh, in the past, we, I, I've taken them to the soccer field with me when um, our sons uh, were playing soccer or football um, or to the, uh, the horse barn with me. While my daughter's riding horses, we're having a conversation about um, what's next. What what is God drawing you to? Um, you're a teacher. Are you are are you ready to um, you know start leading one of our um, children's uh, you know classes? What what is? I'm pretty passionate about food and cooking, and we tend to have a um, in people come over, so yeah, come alongside. You wanna learn how to make some spaghetti? Yeah, let's do that. Let's uh, get a, several people to come over at Christmas. Um, a few weeks before Christmas, bring your Christmas cookie recipe and let's do that. And as you're doing that, you've got, I've got all different ages there. So I've got people interacting and then they're building that relationship that's going to move them further. I see them later on having a conversation with this um, younger and woman and this older woman are having a conversation in their beginning that um, mentorship, that discipleship program. That's so good. And, 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 and dial in on that, not per se what she said, but what she said, or all of them are saying, right, Sunday morning is amazing and we have a great opportunity to come and worship King Jesus and to hear good biblical preaching and teaching but man, we have to do more than just Sunday morning at one hour, or we have to do more than the, the city group or the community group or the Bible study. Like we have 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and don't make it complex, make it intersections. But the other thing there is she didn't mention, but I've, I've seen it, and I know these guys would be true, is it's not just about hanging out with people, it's about hanging out with people and praying with them, hanging out with people and reading scripture, hanging out and having tough conversation about like is your character and my character becoming more like Jesus. So this is a free for all, and then we're gonna hear some questions from the audience. So whoever wants to jump in, or if multiple of you guys, and if need be, I'll, I'll shut it down. Uh, what are some of the best practices in raising up leaders? Very practical. What are some best practices? One or two, three things that are working or you're seeing working or that you're doing? Because you guys are all practitioners. And where can somebody find resources or tools to ri raise up more leaders? I guess I'll start. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I think that first, uh, it's, it's really good to start by creating a leadership structure uh, for your church uh, so that you know that as you raise leaders, um, where each one of those leaders can be placed. And then once you have determined a, a leadership structure that works for your church, uh, create uh, you know, pathways and pipelines for developing leaders that will fill those positions um, and I think that uh, those two things are great starting points. And um, 
when it comes to resources, man, the church development library uh, that's available for free uh, for, to, to Southern Baptist churches, thanks to you know, uh, generous giving uh, that makes these resources available. Um, I think it's a great one-stop shop for you know, things like, again, leadership development, systems and structure, and things like that. Um, and we also have, and you already uh, shared this resource, um, which is newchurches.com, lots of uh, articles and courses that we can explore there that can help us you know, track away from where we are to where we can be in terms of leadership development. So I think those two things are, are key. Let me just jump in. Uh, the, the, you know, if you go all the way uh, in your process, and there's people who feel like, man, like C was sharing earlier, man, I'm I'm called to full time vocational ministry. I'm called to, to vo or vocational ministry by vocational, whatever the case may be. A Southern Baptist, uh, and it's amazing that I that I discovered that most people in our churches do not know this. We have six seminaries, and um, and they have. They have Bible colleges in them, and they have the seminaries. You can get everything from an associate degree all the way to, to, uh, to a doctorate. And every Southern Baptist, if you're, if you're a member of a Southern Baptist church, you will receive, if, if your church signs off on this, a half scholarship. So really, they're, they're, we, we have the whole gamut. Our, 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 in our denomination, we have every, all, the, all, the, all the resources from the beginning to the very, to the very end. So uh, we're, we're very blessed uh, in, in that. That's good. Uh, yeah, quick thought is you just got to let them do it. Uh, I heard about this uh, from Dr. Mark, but it's called the 5% method or 5% principle. Uh, you're going to give someone an opportunity to do something and it will not be to the quality that you would do it. And you got to be okay with it. Like they just need reps and they need opportunity to like do the things of ministry and it's okay if it doesn't look exactly how you would do it. They're getting an opportunity that they're sharing with someone else. Like, you need to release control, which for me is hard because I like to control things. But it's so much more joyful when, when I get to watch someone else do all of the ministry. And I just get to sit back and look and be like, wow, they've been equipped to do it. And now they kind of messed up a couple times, messed up their version it doesn't look like mine, but it's like they did it. Uh, so I think that's super, super important. That's good. Um, I really like to use the scripture when I'm meeting with other women and um, I like to get to know our local cafes um, or restaurants and um, use it almost as a double where they are seeing me regularly and they're like, why are you coming in and meeting, you know, what, are, what do you do? Um, so it's a great opportunity to um, also share the gospel with some people that don't. And I really think being present is one of the hugest things that we can do. Being present, um, uh, you know, uh, it might be on the phone at one point, but being um, available and being present. And that's hard, right? Because we're going to go back to the time factor, and, and so that's where we carve out that and we, you know, keep the text going back and forth until we land on it. So real quick, and then we're going to get an audience question or two. How big a church do you have to be or do you have to have a title to make leaders? You, exactly. You just have to be a biblical church yeah. uh, in order for you to develop leaders. I mean, it goes back to what Mark was saying earlier. You know, if, if you're a church, then uh, part of your responsibility is to develop those that are part of that church. So it doesn't matter the size, doesn't matter the budget, it's just a matter of doing what we've been called to do. That's so good. That's good. All right, question real quick. Raise your hand. Stand up. Give me a question. Come on. What you got for these guys? Whoa. Come on. All right, come on. The question that I have is, um, how does beliefs play into um, getting people to, to, to rise to the occasion? Now, 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 we know about faith, but I'm talking about beliefs, right? How we grew up, the things that have been programmed in our minds. How can we use, how can we um, kind of deal with that 
because I think sometimes what people believe is, is, is the way that the behavior is a, is a manifestation of what their belief systems are. So can anybody touch on that? How do beliefs affect leadership development? You mean beliefs theologically, or are you talking about beliefs on themselves? About, just about themselves. Well, it doesn't matter at the end of the day what they believe about themselves, it's what God says about them, right? So that's what we want to let them know, remind them who they are uh, once they become a child of God. You know, so that, that message has to be continually uh, teach, taught and, and preached within, with, to others and to ourselves too, by the way. Uh, I, uh, I teach a discipleship class at Family Church and I had um, a young lady in that Sunday morning class who had just gotten saved um, and she was asking, when can I now go make disciples? Because I just got saved, I'm new, I'm scared, I don't know what to say. Um, so I just went back to what Jesus said, like, don't worry about what to say for in the moment, the Holy Spirit will give you the right words to say, because people can believe all of these lies about themselves or believe inadequacies that they're not ready or, you know, uh, good enough to do evangelism or discipleship. But if they're willing and someone is walking alongside of them, helping them understand the truth of who God says they are and what the Bible says, then they can do it. You just gotta let them know and encourage them. Like, hey, you lack nothing. You've been given everything you need for life and godliness. Now go do it. Um, just encourage them in what God's word says, what is actually true. Another question? Any questions out there? Okay. Well, we hope you'll have some questions in the days ahead. So, oh, right here, whoa, come on, come on. When we're gathering those first believers before they're the lost people, what do you guys think to get them in the door? What's the most crucial element? Is it the worship experience, the children's ministry, youth, the EV program, small groups? What's helping churches getting people in the door in South Florida? Great question. Different, different doors, different, different people, different doors. I don't think there's just one, one way, just me personally. I think just... Different people are, are, you know, gravitate towards small groups and others for the large worship. You know, there's these battles historically about, oh, small group is the best way of reaching unchurched people. And, well, guess what? The, you know, a big, a big crowd also, is, some people don't want to be in a small group. So I, ju I just think it's uh, we, the more options we have, the more chances we have of reaching all people for Christ. There's a good short book, and I'm sure that many are familiar with it. Uh, it's by Max Stiles. It's called Evangelism. And one of the things that he stresses in that book is the importance of creating a culture of evangelism in the church. And so when that culture is there, uh, is, in, is there in small groups, is there in children's ministry, is there on Sundays, is there all the time. So um, when the members of the church know that that's the kind of culture that they can invite their friends or unbelieving family members to, they'll know that no matter where they plug them in, they'll hear the gospel. Uh, it's gonna be present there. So I would, I, I would uh, suggest that, you know, our focus should be in creating that culture uh, so that we can have that confidence to invite people in and know that they'll, the Lord will save them by the power of the gospel. Amen. Amen. Another question? Right here. So my question is, as a leader, when you come... When you uh, come across some people that says they've been hurt by the church, so as a leader, how can you, what kind of advice can you actually give these people? Because the fact that they've been hurt before, they don't want to come back to church. I think it starts with being really intentional and in getting to know the person talking because especially in culture today, people throw terms around all the time. And maybe, I'm not saying this is 100% of the time or even 50%, but maybe for someone, they're saying they've had church hurt, but maybe they've just sinned and had church discipline and now they're calling it church hurt. And you <coughs> won't know that until we have a relationship with them and you're talking to them through that um, so I, I don't want to just like make one blanket statement and say like, it's always 100% of the, 
of the time the church did something wrong. Maybe they did it right, but they responded wrong in their heart, and you have an opportunity to walk them through that. And then other times, churches aren't perfect. We make mistakes. We're going to actually do something that is not right or biblical, and someone will be impacted by that negatively. Um, ap- apologize for you know what was said to them. Let them know, replace the lie with the truth. This is what God actually says. We want you here. Um, you belong to God. We want you to feel like you belong here, that kind of thing. Um, so that was just two different ways to, to look at that. That's really good. If you, well, go, if you go to scripture, uh, the apostle Paul was hurt a lot by, by people in the church. And, uh, you know, he kept on going. So at the end of the day, what I try to tell people is, hey, uh, you know, acknowledge whatever happened, but at the same token, man, if you're going to put your focus on people, uh, even Christians and leaders and pastors, uh, you will, you will, uh, you will be disappointed. Uh, you will, that, that, you will be sorely disappointed. But if you place your, if you place your look and you place your focus on Jesus, you'll never be disappointed. That's really good. Well, hey, we're going to wrap this up. Can we thank these guys for uh, encouraging? And, um, before you guys sit down, um, Al, will you pray over these men and women that God will, um, man, encourage their hearts, um, man, just remind them daily, greater is he that sent them than he that's in the world. And um, in a little while, like when we finish up later today, like you guys are going back out into the mission field. Looked into the harvest of plentiful laborers are few. So pray, Lord, the harvest that he would send laborers. And you guys are an answer to the prayer. So you pray. Father, we come before your presence acknowledging that you're a good and gracious and loving God who saved us from our sins, redeemed us, and then call us uh, to serve in the highest area in life, and that's the kingdom of God. So, Lord, I, I thank you for these individuals that have, that have come here this morning, Lord, who have taken time from their uh, a busy Saturday uh, to invest in what they're doing uh, in their local churches Lord, I, I pray that they would see just incredible um, results from this time that they've had here. And Lord, that uh, I would just pray that all, all these, uh, all that was said and done, Lord, would somehow um, impact us in a way that we will return different as we came here, Father. Uh, maybe some of us here are, 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 are sensing a call uh, to, to, to a higher level of service. And Lord, that today would be that day, that today would be the day they go back to their pastor's and let them know, hey, God's calling me. Just like Steve shared with us this morning, uh, I, 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 it's time that I, I, that I need to step up and I need to surrender and I'm, and I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do whatever it takes to, uh, to be a pastor, a missionary, whatever that may be. So Lord, thank you for those that are here and, and thank you those that who, who've also taught and, and shared. It's just been just a blessing. Thank you for Tim and his leadership. Thank you for all that he brings to the table and, and all these partnerships that we have with Palm Beach Baptist Network, uh, the North American Mission Board, Florida Baptist Convention, Southern Baptist. Lord, thank you that uh, that together, Lord, we can do so much for the for the kingdom of Christ. And this we pray in Jesus. Amen.